This session is presented in English with subtitles available in English and French. To toggle the subtitles, please use the menu at the bottom of the video. Hi everyone, I'm Radwa Saad, uh, Director of Data and Policy at Innovate BC. Let me start first by acknowledging that our office is located on the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil peoples. I invite you all to share in the chat where you're tuning in from. Before we begin, I want to take a moment to tell you about organize, our organization and the work that we do. Innovate BC is a crown agency of BC, and our goal is to help foster innovation in British Columbia so that British Columbians can benefit from a thriving, sustainable, and inclusive innovation economy. We help scientists, researchers, innovators, and entrepreneurs solve the world's biggest challenges and build great companies. And we do this by providing them with access to capital, talent, mentorship, and market connections. As part of our work, we foster new partnerships that bring new benefits to BC's tech and innovation communities. An exciting partnership we've formed is with Innovation Asset Collective, or IAC for short, to bring you today's event, as well as several other events you may have attended this past year. With this partnership, we're providing business owners and entrepreneurs in BC better access to intellectual property resources to help them protect and develop their ideas. So thank you to IAC and thank you everyone for joining us for this highly anticipated fireside chat with Dan Bresnitz. I think we had a record number of registrations for this event. So clearly everyone is very eager to hear from Dan. We had the pleasure of having Dan come to BC and speak at South Island Prosperity Partnerships Rising Economy Week Conference and meet with some of Innovate BC's board members and executives. I think Innovate BC's chair, Andrew Petter, and Innovation Commissioner, Jerry Sinclair, are in our audience today, so I just wanna give them a quick shout out. So without further ado, I'd like to pass things over to Mike McLean, CEO of Innovation Asset Collective. Over to you, Mike. Thanks, Radwa. Appreciate the introduction. My name is Mike McLean. I'm the CEO at the Innovation Asset Collective. We are a federal government funded not-for-profit put in place to help Canadian SMEs learn how to use intellectual property to compete in global markets and scale their businesses. Here today to talk with Dan Bresnitz. Dan is one of the leading thinkers on innovation and how it can drive economic growth and prosperity and has a lot of really interesting thoughts to, to share with us today. So I want to dive, dive right in. Hi, Dan. How are you? I'm fine. Uh, how are you? I'm doing well. So why don't we start off with a, uh, maybe a simple question. How, how did you get engaged in innovation policy uh, and, and have that be a focus for, for your career? Sort of by mistake. Um, I'll, I'll give you the short story. On one side, I opened what was called a software company because uh, nobody knew what a startup is at the time uh, in Israel. Um, 30 years ago, um, while a student, and then uh, decided, uh, got accepted to MIT and thought that I'll actually do much more theory and political economy stuff, went to MIT, then came back to Israel. And suddenly I found out, um, you know, we didn't know what venture capital is. We developed this kind of a model of consultancy in order to uh, actually get enough money so we can do some R&D on the side. By the time I came back, basically three years later, people in high school could talk with me about the term sheet of venture capitalist and wow. what would be the best offers and all the rest. And I started to be very, very curious through, you know, I'm interested in social change and social change for the good. What has happened here? How suddenly this completely changed? Um, and uh, started to look at and and three books later, maybe <laughs> four, here we are. As with many very interesting careers, it's the the unplanned or unexpected that usually results in in the most interesting outcomes. Please. So one of the key key points you make is is explaining the difference between innovation and invention. Can you talk us through why that distinction is is important for to understand in, within Canada? Sure. So let's 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 first remember, and I think that's the most important thing, especially for. Uh, Innovate BC and the uh, Innovate Asset um, Collective. Why do we care about innovation? We care about innovation because of its impact, social impact. It's the only way to create sustained economic growth, but also to improve human welfare. 
But that's happen only when you innovate, meaning that does not happen when you do the act of invention. Coming up with a new idea is great. It's really important. And that's what we do in universities, you know, when I'm back in the university. Um, but that's not enough. As a matter of fact, speaking about the asset collective, it's not even enough to come with a patent. Innovation happens when you, instead of the action of coming up with a new idea, you take new ideas and actually implement them in the reality. You innovate. And that can happen with, uh, you can create new products or services. You can improve new uh, products and services. You can improve the production of those products, the sustainability of those products. You can combine them and come up with better products. And that's where real social welfare and impact and what we care about happen. And let's do just an example of what we do now. If you and I had to do this talk, this event with by now about 160 people online, even 10 years ago, using a technology by way, an invention which is at least 40 to 50 years old, teleconferencing, we would avoid it at any way or shape possible because both you and I will have to go to special rooms with special equipment, the whole audience would have to be in also a special room or one room, and the product would be awful. But because we had millions of engineering hours, maybe days probably, working on more efficient memory, more efficient data processing, more efficient algorithm, more efficient CPUs, more efficient graphic, uh, we, when COVID happened, just turned on Zoom and found out that it works. And as a matter of fact, we now no longer core care about its price. For us, it's free. It's like electricity or having running water. And that completely changed what happens in COVID to the whole society. And that's what we care about innovation. And that's only happened not only when you start to innovate, when you have continuous innovation until you create a product which is reliable enough, but also accessible enough that all of humanity can actually use it. That's when change happens. It's a great example. I think really, really helps picture the difference and, and why it's so important. When many of us think of innovation, we think of Silicon Valley as, as the center and really the model of, of success. Um, do you have some concerns about that as the focal point um, or the model that is, that is being emulated or replicated? Uh, can you talk to why Canadian cities or regions should avoid trying to be the Silicon Valley of the North? Okay, first, um, let's just be blunt, right? I'm now unmuzzled. I'm not in the federal government. We should avoid it first and foremost because we will fail and it will be a very costly fail. But let's assume, let's just assume one of them managed to do that. The result in terms of its community is almost as horrific in terms of uh, growing inequality, um, you already see it to a degree, even in you know Vancouver, Toronto, Montreal. Let's just not even think about what happened in Silicon Valley itself or Tel Aviv, for example. That's one. Um, and the reason, and the other reason is that this is all not only the one way to innovate. This is the innovation right after invention, novel product. You're trying to come up with new products and new uh, services new to the world. Um, what happened because of globalization? That those now, in order to translate to things we actually sell and buy, um, are divided into different stages of what we call production. Now, thanks to COVID, again, everybody heard about value chain. Before that, I now had to spend 10 minutes to explain what they are. But basically, it means that in order to have any product or services, we now have specific stages of production, each one of them needs very different innovation capabilities. For example, on semiconductors, if you think about places like uh, Silicon Valley, Tel Aviv, Seoul, Taiwan, Shinchu Park, and China, all of them have really successful semiconductors industries. <clears throat> In most of them, if not all, you have the same companies working for. So you might think it's the same industry, 
but it's not. If you actually look at what they do in each place, they do very different things. So in Silicon Valley and Tel Aviv, we try to put new ideas of, of what you put on Silicon. As we now know, the only place in the world that actually know how to make those ideas into Silicon is Taiwan. And then just look at who gains from that in Silicon Valley and Tel Aviv versus Taiwan. What kind of people, the number of the people, um, whether or not the impact, right? We are talking about taxpayers' money for innovation, why we care innovation. Do you have more inclusive prosperity and more sustained prosperity in Taiwan or Silicon Valley? I'll let you guess, but the answer is not Silicon Valley. And the reason is also because of the way we now, what the Silicon Valley means for how you finance and sponsor and spur innovation. What happened in the Silicon Valley, once you go with venture capital, is that by definition, you need a financial exit. Let's not go right now to, if you have a financial exit, what does that mean for a Canadian company and whether that financial exit will ever happen in Canada? And therefore, the profits go to Canada or to the US. Let's forget that for a moment. But it means that you now have a time bomb. So what those VCs do and what those entrepreneurs do is they try to develop models that can very quickly can create a company that can not a product necessarily, but a company that can be sold for a huge amount of money. So we are taking our the people we shouldn't care about, to be very honest. So the graduate of our best engineering schools, you know, the MIT and Stanford of the US, the UBC, Waterloo, Toronto, McGill of Canada, uh, they will get wonderful wages and uh, lottery tickets called stock options. So instead of just, you know, poor millionaires will become billionaires, their financiers, mostly American, would really enjoy it. Few lawyers, few celebrity chefs, but what happened to the rest of the 90% of Canadians? But actually, taxpayers paid for all that thing and all the research behind it. They're not even in the game. And that's a problem, assuming we even succeed, a succeed in order, uh, you know, in our attempt to create the Silicon Valley of the North, which we have been playing this game for 40, 50 years without any success. Maybe we should play a different game. And that's that's a key thesis in in your new book, the innovation in real places strategy for prosperity in an unforgiving world. You really explore that topic in terms of alternatives that regions or locales in Canada can use to look at innovation to drive social good, to drive inclusive growth. What are the some of the key themes you think are should be considered by by Canadian regions looking to change the economic dynamic in in, in their area? So let me uh, let me give you some example. Be a slightly more uh, precise because we're sponsored by British Columbia. So unlike what we like to say, Canada is not a small country. It's maybe the second, if I remember correctly, the second biggest in the world in terms of geography, a very diverse geography, uh, with also means um, diverse capabilities, needs, um, opportunities um, with, and that's where I agree, not that many people on that space. What that's actually that means for you is that it's a natural place in order to have multiple regional experiments. Remember, I talked about those stages in different stages and different industries. So British Columbia, and I'll give you two examples. Uh, I have friends in the British Columbia uh, forestry industry, and they all, excuse my language, uh, complain bitterly on the fact that all the equipment, and they just can't understand why, comes from a, com a country called Finland. And the reason is that Finland, when it went into a forestry industry it, and saw that there is value added to be had and good uh, jobs, um, infuse innovation, basically ICT innovation, if you remember Nokia, into that sector. The sector, when I was there in the early 2000s, all the trees were connected wirelessly. You knew everything, all 
the machinery was what we now call autonomous and they pick up and all of that was done by Finnish companies. Okay. Um, it's behoove us as Canadian and as British Colombian, some of us, to start figuring out how we can do that in our natural resource um, industries. We all claim that we want to be green. Um, we need more or less an order or magnitude more mining. Can we do this mining in British Columbia in a way that is not going to create an environmental catastrophe worse than what supposedly an electric vehicle can fix? And also in a way that it's smart, create industries around it and talking about good jobs for people who are not R&D engineers, uh, it's lovely to claim that they might be able to get a good jobs, uh, you know, working for Tesla in a battery, but why not in the uh, mining industry, the service of a mining industry, the recycling of mining tails industry, equipment for mining, uh, I haven't seen any of those kinds of thinking, and, and I, I'm sorry that I'm damning British Columbia, Ontario is worse, um, on, on the things where you would expect us to be leader in innovation. And the reason is we look at the US and say, wow, look at what daddy's doing. Let's do the same when we are not the same country. That's a great point. So it is finding areas of current strength where you can create leverage and really expand the value add in and around those strengths rather than trying to create something from scratch that will be challenging and create unequal returns at, at the back end. Correct. I would also add, um, some of you might know the semiconductor industry. Uh, Canada has been, again, speaking about green, extremely good in certain areas of uh, semiconductors, which are actually not silicon-based. But instead of having a strategy, how we can excel in that, uh, we are letting those companies being sold one by one to foreign companies, Germans, Americans, all the rest. And instead, we are focused on playing, you know, yesterday's war around silicon-based semiconductors. Let me just say, because I know this, we have no chance winning against Taiwan, Korea, and the U.S., we might have the chance if we went to semiconductors that are not silicon based, if we went to other niches. Um, now I'm not sure that even in those niches, we have not missed that chance. And by the way, that chance, if you create fabrication of those new semiconductors, mm -hmm. where the government needs to come, it's cost a lot of money, that will create sustained jobs, a lot of IP, Sustain competitive advantage for a generation, not for five years until we sell that company. I'm waiting for somebody to actually pick that gun and says, I'm going to run with it. I love that example. I spent the, the first 25 years of my career in the semiconductor space, so very familiar um, and agree very much. The, the primary silicon-driven segments of that have scaled so far beyond where we are that the ability to catch up um is is not there but there are very specific niches where we do have an edge have over the years and and if we can leverage off that uh, there's things that can be built i would i would say that by the way one of the other things where we constantly try to do is health we're really really good at that but i don't understand why we constantly try to be the us or uh, in health instead of trying to be the switzerland or taiwan in health meaning that every time comes a new technology of manufacturing drugs, which is very hard. And um, just look at who actually produces uh, the mRNA uh, vaccines for Moderna. Um, we can create, you know, the TSMCs of Canada in biomanufacturing, in non-silicon semiconductor manufacturing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But we never think strategically about this game. We only, we only think about the game of trying to beat the U.S. in its own game. And let me tell you, um, you're in an innovation asset collective. I don't think we can win that game anymore. We are completely, our freedom to operate is so restricted that we need to figure out different ways to win.
That freedom to operate piece is an interesting one. We'll come back to that later in the conversation. That's definitely something I want to want to touch on. Similar to some of the examples you just raised from a Canadian perspective, another company and industry uh, that you use as an example of your book is is the bicycle industry and and giant out of out of Taiwan. Can you talk about why that's a great example and a model that has been successful that is different than the Silicon Valley model? Sure. So let's let's I'll remind the example. And then we'll talk about it. Yeah. Um, why I think it's an, 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 a wonderful example for uh, Canada, because this is actually not innovation in bike. Okay. This is innovation in material science. And then figuring out how that innovation in material science can gain you a, a hold in an industry. So the short story is that there is a company called Giant. It's an OEM for bicycles back in the days for American bicycle so they actually produce a bicycle sold under the name of a different company when everything was moved they saw that everything is going to be moved to china so what they did is they came to a collective agreement uh them and a few other bicycle companies with uh, itri which is basically the taiwanese nrc with their lab of material science and said look together and back then, carbon fiber was a new technology. And they said, okay, if you will teach us how to figure out carbon fiber so we can develop frames, uh, we know how to save industry. And, and I actually interviewed the engineers of ITRI, including the head of that. And, and he said to them, he actually admitted that, why do you want carbon fiber? This is just for defense. Remember when we were talking oh. about and the Businessman said, don't worry, we'll know what we do. And indeed, they knew. Once they figure it out, right, it's a joint. And it's by way the way, the same way that the Taiwanese become so good at semiconductors, uh, become so good at net, uh, netbooks, become so good at cellular phones and smartphones. Um, once they master carbon fiber, they started to create frames which are a lot stronger and a lot lighter than regular frames and then they could start changing the bicycle industry itself so um, let me guess that you and i are more or less the same age so when we were young a mountain bike would weigh more or less our own weight so we need to be a semi-professional athlete to even carry the damn thing around and wouldn't be that comfortable let's call it driving um and would be unbelievably expensive. Come carbon fiber, and it's now so light that not only you don't need to be semi a professional athlete, you can be old, you can be weak, you can be any gender you want, and you can still do mountain biking to the same level of those semi professional athletes. And the same then go to all the bicycle that you see in the road. And all that happened and continue to happen because you have a national research lab working with a set of companies to infuse new innovation and then also the people who know how to work in this innovation into uh, the industry, creating, by the way, since, again, you're a collective uh, intellectual assets, um, creating a lot of IP around it, which was shared of that collective, that co- I mean, multiple consortiums, everybody shared the IP. So, um, you know, when anyone actually wanted to sue the giants and their Taiwanese friends, they had a packet of patents and intangibles to fight back, sponsored by their local NRC. It's a great, great success story. I didn't realize how important giant was in Taiwan until the first time I flew into Taipei. And one of the first things you see in the airport is a display of their bikes and and really promoting the importance of, of that company. It's It's been a big success story. And again, it's from a city you probably never heard about. Uh, it's competing now with a lot cheaper and a lot more state-led companies from China, very successful, produce a huge amount of jobs, again, for people who are university graduates and R&D engineers. And for people who are not, different skills, master craftsmen, and a huge amount of prosperity 
to that city in that region around it. Tying back to the, the semiconductor play, TSMC also having its root uh, out of out of Vitry as well. And if you enjoy orchids, you should also thank the Taiwanese government for making them so affordable, more or less using the same strategy. Very interesting. That is that is a story I did not know. So what what should Canadian companies take from this? Are there approaches at at the firm level that should be considered when when Canadian startups or scale ups are are thinking about how to compete and grow in in today's economy? I think I trashed enough both government and ideas in Canada. Let me also put some blame back into business. And I'm not talking about small companies. I want to make sure that people understand that. Or the startup sector, which I I actually think are doing heroically under conditions that are far less than optimal. However, you looked since around 96. Um, I will give you a hint. Other things happened in 96 with change with terms of trade for Canada. And up to 96, we, meaning all the Canadian private businesses of all kinds, was actually moving and becoming more and more innovative and even more importantly, engage with new technology, new equipment, new knowledge. And you see that in the things that you know a lot of people like to... Uh, measure and discuss called BIRD, business investment R&D and equipment. But you also see it in other things we should really care about. The Human Development Index, Canada was number one, now we are number 15 or 16. So our ability, our business sector ability to engage with knowledge has been going down. What I will tell many companies, um, and I think the story that you asked me to tell of a Taiwan bicycle industry uh, is an example that no matter in what industry you are, and no matter in what level of that industry, right? You're just a tiny OEM of a multinational that just dumped, you, which is giant, or you're you need to understand that innovation is your tool to win your engagement with knowledge. And a lot of the time, again, and I'm just using the example we talked about, it's knowledge you don't have and you don't even know you might want to have. So Giant without E3 would have never heard about carbon fiber. So there's a role for both sides. But without Giant saying, we need to change things, we need to innovate, we need more knowledge, let's do it. And organizing a collective of companies to go for it together, in finding a business model which is not competing with the best R&D labs of the multinationals, giant would have not happened. Um, so the government can do certain things, definitely. Uh, we don't have a right regulatory framework. Our comp- competition framework is a joke. I hope that some people in Ottawa hear me. I can say it again. Our compet- competition framework is a joke, and we need to change it, seriously change it. I think the CIC would help in, let's call it, the push and supply side. But without this being a private public action in order to change the structure and the future of the Canadian economy, this is not going to work. Because in the end of the day, for better or for worse, innovation happens by companies and individuals, not by the government. Uh, so what I will say to businesses as you want to survive, you want to prosper, and you actually want to make Canada better, and our children having better jobs that are better paying and also most more interesting, start to engage with knowledge more. And I think that at least in British Columbia, partly in Ontario, Quebec, probably most of the provinces, and also on the federal levels, there are partners on the government side that are at least willing to help. They might not be doing what you think is the best, but at least start a discussion. Create a coalition of companies that are like-minded, figure out what you want and where you want to try out, and then go and get some help, probably resource and finance and connections from the government. Don't assume that the government actually knows what is best for you, what is a way to innovate, how to innovate. 
they don't and they shouldn't. Innovation is done by company. Big ideas, ask for help, push to drive them forward. It sounds sounds like the, the core advice there. In, in that response, you mentioned the CIC and you've recently wrapped up a role with the finance department helping to frame and 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 stand up that new initiative. Can you talk us through sort of the thinking there and, and what that new initiative is, is designed to accomplish? Let me first go one step back and says uh and 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 say how I got there. Okay. I got because I think it's really important, especially if people from government, the federal government, but also provincial government is. I came as a Clifford Clark economist, which is a unique position. It's a unique position because the mission statement of that position is not come and help us in X. It is infuse the Department of Finance with new ideas and new thinking. Because, you know, once you join any organization, but especially a huge bureaucracy, you start to be isolated. And what the idea of Clifford Clark Economist, you know, I'm the last one, I'm not the first, is that they come and infuse with new ideas, work on various initiatives and all the rest. Each one come with a different background. So people, those who recruited me, knew that I'm a political economist, really interested in innovation, but I also dealt with other stuff. I think this is crucial. And if we can have more of those positions into government on both a provincial and federal level uh, to take the best ideas from academia and private business, infuse those ideas, not necessarily in the way of thinking, not necessarily a specific initiative, into government and start a language that both sides understand, that's probably more important you know, than one initiative, even if you know I'm really proud of what we achieved in the CIC, but that's more important. Now about the CIC. Um, when I came, which is, and the part of the reason I agreed was indeed COVID and coming out of COVID, one of the things that we had a team looking at is our very, very long term, as I said, since about 96, failure in innovation. And the fact that we have tried multiple programs and initiatives each one of them very, you know, and they all failed. I mean, some of them are doing interesting stuff. Some of them that are actually very old, like IRAP or STDC, doing really good in their specific niche. But you look over all of the Canadian economy, and we are keep on going down with horrible impact on median wages, working hours, interest in jobs of Canadians. Um, and then the question was, okay, so what can we, and remember, we is finance, and then I said, it's not the whole government, can do, and I think people need to understand that. This is the Department of Finance, and I said, okay, and finance is finance. We, in finance, we don't have R&D labs. Um, do, in order to start to change, and one of the most important thing that we figure out that this is a structural problem around what we call innovation and R and D and the creation of intangible. Um, we need a body that actually its mission is to tackle that, and it's obvious that because it's systematic and structural that we might have some good ideas. But if anyone tells you that they have just one model and just one solution, it will solve 30 years of failures in all of Canada, either she's delusional or she's lying. So instead, we decided that we are very humble. We are creating uh, an organization that will start to have that skills, that actually needs to bring people from the industry. It needs to experiment very quickly and scale up what works, put down what doesn't. So it cannot be part of a government because, you know, politically, you're going to destroy the career of any minister uh, if you create an organization that's going to, of the first five policy attempts, fail at three. Let's not talk about one that fails at four, okay? So you need that. You need to be able to bring those skills, um, and you need to start hacking at the problem. And 
you also need to remember why you're doing it. And you are doing it in order to have more innovation in Canada. So you also need, like our organization, and by way of organization is built on the best examples of those kind of organization that I talk about worldwide uh, in countries that we can learn from. Um, idea is, is we doing innovation in order to have more innovation in Canada. And therefore, we must be disciplined and stick. So if a company is getting millions or hundreds of millions in order to innovation and that innovation does not stay in Canada, then they have uh, not fulfilled their part of the uh, you know, agreement, the social contract that we signed with them, right, as public taxpayers' money, and they will need to be fined. But if they do and they're successful, we're going to lower our risk, lower their uncertainty to maximize innovation. We're going to help them. We're going to, speaking again, what, where are you coming from, teach them about intangibles, connect them with organizations like you, uh, and start to see what actually work in different places, different industries, different stages in Canada, and try to scale it up, you know, without um, creating yet one more program that does just one thing. Very interesting. So we're talking a extremely broad and varied mandate with some freedom to experiment. So I would actually say that the mandate is not very broad. The mandate okay. is very focused. I mean, you will know it, it, it's it's a mandate that takes five years to start to see if you're doing the right things, right? Right. Which is to maximize innovation, uh, defined as more R&D leading to new or improved products or services sold by Canadian companies and owned by Canadian companies. Um, but... In terms of the tools, yes, it's extremely broad. And there's a lot of leeway on purpose. You know, we also saw what work um, in Sustainable Development Technology Canada. A lot of leeways uh, for the CEO and the board and their team uh, to try out what works, what not, collect data about what happened in the industry, see, you know, if you're successful three or five years down the road, industry would look different. It will have different obstacles, different bottlenecks. You need to develop different tools to deal with it. But you always focused very clearly on your mission. And if the metrics does not compete in the end of the day, you know, boards fire CEOs. So it, it sounds like the the standing up of that initial CEO and, and the there are there's going to be some really key decisions to be made in in the near future absolutely and i would also say the one other thing that i forgot to say this is an organization that aims to be as quick as business so the uh, global best practices now are less than 12 weeks so if you and i come create a startup just as an example right uh, come up with an idea for a new product submit it this is going to be decided purely based on its technological. So somebody who actually understands the technology, again, business, uh, will evaluate it and say, yes, it can be done. Yes, we don't know, right? Because it's a new product, but it's exportable. You will know in less than 12 weeks whether you get the money and the funding, and then you can, the matching money, and then you can make the real investment decision, knowing the resource you have. Instead of, actually having to jump, take all the risk, so most people in organization will never take it, and then hope that a year later you might or might not get some of that money. That that speed of decision-making is so important. That's something we hear from our member companies all the time, that when they engage with government, um, getting to decisions quickly is can be challenging, and that's their number one criteria for success is, is fast decisions so they, they can move quickly and get things done. And if any one of you actually worked with VCs, getting a decision in less than three months is usually a part, you know, from mythical stories about Google, uh, more or less as fast as private VCs will ever go. Agreed. I've been through both a VC and private equity investment scenarios, and that's as fast, if not faster, than, than those processes, for sure. I want to link back to 
the freedom to operate that you mentioned uh, earlier in the conversation. Um, that's obviously something very important to to us at IEC, and we think for Canadian business leaders and 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 companies to really understand that concept and how it can impact their growth perspectives. Can you can you touch on your thoughts around around freedom to operate? One thing about the book and why it's slightly different than any other book that I wrote. Um, it looks at what a, a regional leader can do. So be if she is a, a mayor uh, up to maybe the level of her premier, okay? It's not the mythical, you know, president of the United States that can change things, assuming she can do that, but, you know, the mythical one in academia. It's, it's real, what a mayor, what a region can do. And the reason I'm saying that, because then in the end of a book, there are three chapters about things that it's crucial for regional leaders to know a lot about because they have to deal with them and their companies have to deal with them. But the chances that they can really change them for multiple reasons are almost zero. And from the point of view of startups or regional leaders that want to have innovation-based growth, we are dysfunctional. Not from the point of view of Wall Street, by the way, but from the point of view of, I want to have more innovation in Canada. And that's a problem. Uh, one of them, of course, is IP. And by the way, IP are not only patents, as you know very well. Um, and you look at just the production of IP around the world. It has exploded each and every kind. We talk about patents, but people, people. Companies now do with copyrights and other issues, things and trademarks, things that that makes what they what they force Canadian innovators to deal with with patents like look like you know candies. Yeah. Uh, and we are really bad at that. Okay. And what we then need to, again, assuming that we have no chance of really changing that system. We need to understand that we need to somehow create for our companies this space with, to have a freedom to operate. And there are multiple ways of doing it. Let's just talk about patents. So one of them is what you do as a collective, right? And then the question should be how you operate uh, that collective um, in a way that also deter foreign companies from attacking Canadian companies. So not just the fact that they have more access to IP, but we need to think about, you know, um, offense and defense. Um, it might very well be that you want to be very cynical. And now I'm not talking just about the uh, IAC, but about Canadian uh, regions. And you basically said, okay, I'm allocating uh, a sum of money on the side because if any patent troll is attacking one of my companies, I'm going to organize what's known as a prior research effort to look at each and every of their patents to negate as many of them as possible, knowing that maybe this time my entrepreneurs will suffer, right? And its freedom to operate will be curtailed. But the damage to our trade will so be so big that, you know, IP holders are like bullies. But next time, they'll look for easier targets. And the next generation of Canadian entrepreneurs will have a better freedom to operate. But right now, we're very, very limited in, in playing this game because if you own almost zero intangible assets, if you don't even understand that you need to produce them, you have minimal understanding of how to defend them and I'm not even talking about how to use them profitably to create a business, you're not in the game. And right now, the game of the global economy is based on intangibles. So one of the, the first thing that we need to do, and by the way, China has been amazing in that, is to educate our people and to educate them when they're already companies trying to sell, it's too late. I would argue that to educate them, again, looking at China, educate Canadian about IP in the university is minimal, probably too late. 
um, most of the best Chinese school where people that leave high school know about standards, know about IP, know that about IP, uh, rec- you know, essential patents, things that probably if I go in the street of Canada and said, hey, uh, do you know what is a, you know, a, uh, an essential patent for a technology standard? They don't know what a technology standard, maybe they know what is a patent, but how those words combine together and what does it mean for the company that managed to get this and therefore has a revenue stream of billions of dollars? Zero. And that will be, by the way, in the University of Toronto with our students, not just, you know, on the street somewhere. So we need to start educating. Couldn't agree more. We are uh, very behind when it comes to that expertise and even the outside of the deep subject matter experts, knowing that from a business level of one, recognizing the importance, but two, what are the key pieces you need to build within your firm to ensure you optimize the opportunities for success, great ownership positions that can be monetized and and really can deflect those large international patent positions that can curtail markets for you and, and limit opportunity. Um, that that requires a certain level of knowledge and sophistication that, that's going to have to be built because it's not there today. Let's move on to some questions from the audience. Um, I've been getting a, a steady stream into our into our feed here on the challenge with innovation. Is it getting more difficult and more expensive? Um, the pace of innovation seems to be slowing and becoming more incremental around the world. Any any comments on that scenario? So, is it becoming more difficult? Uh, I'm not sure, right? Because on one side you can say maybe it's becoming more difficult, but on the other side we have so much more knowledge and so much more capacity to innovate. Just think about, you know, our grandfather's uh, generation had to innovate using, uh, you know, pencil and paper. They didn't have any computing power. Um, What is correct is that in multiple industries and multiple areas, but that has been true, you know, in the chemical industry for years, uh, that are mature, maturing, it's be, and are standardized. It's becoming harder and harder to innovate in the way we disrupt. Okay, um, and you need to then look sideways. But, but, you know, you and I started this, and you asked me about this example of a bicycle industry. This is one of the most oldest and standardized industries in the world. The diamond frame, which diamond is famous for, was invented 150 years ago. And yet, somebody found a way how to innovate around it and completely change the industry. Um, The question I, I, I might sound a little bit like I repeat myself, but the question that I think is important for Canada is how we not just invent, but how we actually innovate and how we then create the defenses that allow us the freedom to innovate in Canada and our companies that actually manage to do that because it is really, really hard, actually scale up and be successful in Canada and become a model for uh, more and more and more companies. It's, uh, It's lovely that we had BlackBerry and we have... Shopify, but if we can think about or open text, but you know, if we can think about one company a decade that became, you know, globally known for a country that claims it's G7, maybe we need to um, make that pace, speaking about the rapid pace of innovation, slightly yeah. more rapid. At com- we need to move that bar for sure. Uh, if you look at the companies that are Canadian based that are in a particular bar, top global, top 200s, top 500s, they are typically resourced and finance based. And, and the examples you, you just used are, are few and far between. And, and I would say, by the way, our resource based uh, companies yep. are now falling behind. So, as an example, without naming names and not, you know, putting students on the podium, I would urge each and every one of 
us to look at the top three Canadian mining companies or companies that are in the mining sector, see how many, because we're doing it with the Innovation Asset Collective, how many patents they have in the last five years, and then look at the top three Chinese and see what is the number of patents they have in the last three years, and then wonder who would actually have better profits, who will have a freedom to operate, and who will create more jobs for them people, the Chinese company or the Canadian company. Great point. And I haven't looked at the data, but I have a real good feel how that how that turns out. Another question here on a different tack um, from an individual who has recently left government themselves, wanting to know how receptive government decision makers were to outside thinkers coming in and getting engaged in, in trying to help with these problems. Again, I, I have a, a now, you know, as a social scientist, I have to, you know, hedge and hedge and hedge, but I'm serious. I have an N of one. But they assume I'm not that unique. So I actually found both the civil servants, but also some of the ministers and their political advisors really receptive to it. But they're more receptive to ideas if they are implantable. Meaning that if you come with a very ambiguous ideas and mm, it might be fascinating to we'll have a glass of wine or a pint with you, but nothing will happen. Um, if it's an idea that also explain why why we are failing at something, or or even better, not how why we're failing, but how we can be much better. So both the idea, but what does that mean for Canada? The chances that you will be able to, you know, move a needle. And remember, government is not, as that person probably know if you work in government, are not the fastest moving organizations on earth. But at least in Canada, they're very receptive to ideas. And the more that idea is implementable, the higher chances that this idea would actually become a policy. So help help manage the risk profile of those ideas. Is that another way of saying that? Yes, but also um, if you have an idea, it, it, you know, it might be because right one of the first thing I did in life was to create a software company. So if you, if it's just like the VCs or investors, if you can't explain in five minutes why your idea is actually going to be helpful. So for VCs, how they can make money out of it. But for government, how this is better, both politically, if you talk to the political advisor, but also really better for the public good of Canada in five minutes. Don't expect that your ideas will be bought. I'm sorry. But but that's just the way I was trained. That clarity and articulation, getting that across in a, in a few key points, that's... Um... I think in a lot of walks of life, very, very important. I think that's a great point for us to wrap up on, Dan. Really appreciate the conversation today. I know I could have kept talking on these on these topics for uh, for the rest of the afternoon, but we've got a, a finite amount of time. So really appreciate you uh, taking the time to uh, to speak with us today. Your book's a great read. I, I took a lot from it. Would recommend it to uh, everyone in the audience to uh, pick up a copy. There's a lot of different thinking there and and different thinking that's important for Canadians to to consider if we're going to move forward and, and have a more prosperous future. I would urge anyone who has the opportunity to actually go and do public service. If something annoys you enough to write an op-ed, go do something about it. And if, if you actually are offered the opportunity, by the way, it's a bruising experience, okay? <laughs> Mentally, emotionally, anything. But if you're offer the opportunity to actually join and try to do something and then you say no but write another op-ed i don't know how you can look at yourself in the mirror contribute contribute i like it thank you thank you dan for all your wonderful insights i think uh, a lot of notable takeaways but one that really stood out was around innovations coming out of our own province that give us a competitive edge and the need to nurture grow and adopt those innovations locally um, 
A thank you also to Mike and Innovation Asset Collective for all their work in putting on today's event. Thank you everyone for joining today and enjoy the rest of your day.